everyone, it's Monica. Welcome to my channel. This is where I post educational videos for all levels of doctor training. So today's topic is super, super high yield. It's discharge planning. So no matter what level of training you're at, honestly, you could probably use a review because discharge planning is extremely important and extremely complicated. So what's discharge planning? Discharge planning is making sure you take all the steps necessary to ensure a safe discharge out of the hospital for your patient. And there's a lot that goes into that. So I actually split this topic into two videos because it's so complicated. So the first video, we're just gonna be going over the long list of things that you need to consider when you're discharging a patient. So we'll go through each item and kind of talk about what it is and why it's important. And in part two, which is going to be a second video, I'm gonna be talking about how to keep track of all of these things throughout the hospitalization so you're not scrambling on the day of discharge. Now, discharge planning is far from easy. So don't expect to be an expert at it right away, especially if you're a medical student. It's gonna take a lot of time and practice in order to be able to stay on top of everything throughout the hospitalization. It literally takes a village. It takes, you know, you, your case manager, your social worker, your nurse, your physical therapist, your occupational therapist, a lot of different people are involved to properly prepare a patient for discharge. So the things you need to consider for discharge, let's just go through the list real quick. So you have skilled needs, you have the discharge destination, figuring out where the patient's actually going to go, DME needs, medications that need prior authorization, medication reconciliation, follow-up appointments, dialysis, caregiving needs, health literacy and language barriers, removal of tubes, lines, and drains, and transportation home. So let's start with skilled needs. What are skilled needs? Skilled needs are needs that a patient has that can only be supplied by a licensed professional, such as a nurse or a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. So a list of possible skilled needs includes IV medications, tube feeds, TPN, drain care, wound care, tracheostomy management, insertion and changing of catheters, such as a suprapubic catheter, medication reconciliation or management, and physical and occupational therapy. If your patient has a skilled need, at the bare minimum, they're gonna to need to go home with a home health agency supplying these services. Or if it's too much for them to handle at home, then they're gonna to need to go to a facility that provides these services. So that can be a rehab facility, uh, such as an acute rehab unit or a skilled nursing facility. So skilled needs help determine where a patient can go after discharge. Also, some patients are unfortunately frequently readmitted, so you might get a patient who already have home health services in place at home. That's important to know because once a patient is admitted to the hospital again, those home health services are stopped, they're discontinued, and then you have to make sure you resume them when the patient's discharged again. The next thing is discharge destination. So where is the patient actually gonna go? So this is a huge topic, but luckily I have a whole different video on this. So please go check that out if you want to learn more about discharge destinations. But I talk about everything from home health to skilled nursing facility, to acute rehab unit, to long-term acute care unit. If you are confused about what all of these terms mean, be sure to check that out. But the important thing to know is if you determine what skilled needs your patient has, then that will help determine where the recommended discharge destination would be. Next is DME needs. So DME stands for durable medical equipment. So this is any medical equipment. <laughs> so common DME needs include assistive devices such as canes, walkers, wheelchair, also a shower chair. So an important thing to know about shower chairs is that they're not covered by insurance, so a patient would have to pay out of pocket for a shower chair. But a shower chair is also included as a possible DME. Other common DMEs are a nebulizer, if they need at-home nebulizer treatments, and of course, home oxygen. So it may be impossible to know at the beginning of the hospitalization, but towards the end of the hospitalization, as soon as you start getting the idea that the patient might need to actually go home on oxygen, it's important to start arranging that early because home oxygen can take a few days to get set up and delivered. Now, if you want some help determining which DMEs your patient needs, then you might enlist the help of your physical therapist or your occupational therapist because they can come do an evaluation and try to figure out if your patient needs any assistive devices, for example, for going home. Another thing to consider is medications that need prior authorization. So some medications need extra paperwork for the insurance company to agree to pay for the medication. So these are often medications that are maybe new on the market or they're really expensive and there are cheaper alternatives and the insurance company wants to make sure that you try the cheaper alternatives or wants you to justify 
why you want this particular medication before they agree to pay for it. It's such a pain in the butt, but in any case, some medications do require this and it can take maybe 24 to 48 hours, business hours, for this paperwork to go through and for you to actually get the medication covered. So it's important to know which medications go on this list and you can ask your local case manager to give you a list. Usually they'll have one that has a long list of possible medications that require Pyroth. But if you have that list handy, you can anticipate ahead of time whether or not your patient's gonna be discharged on a new medication that's gonna require Pyroth because then you need to go ahead and get that approved before they leave so that they can actually have a supply in hand when they're discharged. So one example of a medication that never really made sense to me was PO vancomycin for C. diff infection because it is a first line treatment and I for, I've forgotten multiple times that it requires Pyroth. So it'll, I'll be discharging a patient and the day of the pharmacist will message me and be like, hey, by the way, this needs Pyroth. So patient can't have it on the way home. So that's delayed discharge before, like the patient had to actually stay another night. So moral of the story is, Stay ahead of the game, keep track of all the medications that your patient's probably gonna go home on and see if any of those will need Pryoroth and go ahead and send that prescription early on so that the Pryoroth can be submitted and the patient can actually go home with it. So in addition to medications that require Pryoroth, you also wanna keep track of medications in general. You wanna have a good handle on what your patient's discharge medication list is gonna look like and you'll use your progress note to do that. On the day of discharge, or better yet, the day before discharge, it's good to find out if your patient needs refills on their old medications, or if they're gonna need new prescriptions, and also find out what pharmacy your patient wants to use so that you can send your prescriptions ahead of time and all the medications can be ready for pickup on the day of discharge. You also wanna anticipate ahead of time whether or not a patient is gonna need teaching on self-administering medications, particularly injections. So if you're starting insulin for the first time ever, or you're starting Lovenox injections, if your patient's gonna need to learn how to self-administer injections, usually it's the nurse that does that, so the nurse can do some bedside teaching. It's just important for you to be aware so that you can keep track and make sure it does happen before the patient leaves the hospital. Next is follow-up appointments. So every patient is gonna need at least one follow-up appointment. The follow-up appointment that every patient needs no matter what when they leave the hospital is with their primary care doctor. And then on top of that, they might need appointments with subspecialists like cardiology or pulmonology, et cetera. And it's good to have these set up as much as possible before the patient leaves the hospital. Because basically what happens is that if your hospital has schedulers that will contact the patient after the patient leaves, sometimes the patient doesn't answer their phone and the appointments never get scheduled. And it's not hard to imagine that poor follow-up can lead to poor outcomes. So as much as possible, I'd like to submit requests for follow-up appointment scheduling a couple of days before discharge so that this appointment can be scheduled and the patient can have the appointments in hand when they leave. And that significantly increases the chances that they're actually gonna show up to their appointments. So if a consultant such as a cardiologist says in their note, you know, follow up with cardiology in two weeks after discharge, then it's really good to keep track of that. I actually put that in my note as part of my plan to make sure that I remember to put in a request to have that appointment scheduled. Or if you're a medical student and you want some extra credit, you can pick up the phone and make that appointment yourself. Then there's dialysis. Is your patient newly on dialysis? So if that's the case, then things can get a little complicated when they're leaving the hospital because you have to set up a new outpatient dialysis center where they can get dialysis several times a week. So it's usually the case manager that helps with this and each dialysis center or most dialysis centers do require certain labs to be drawn before the patient can be accepted at, their, at that center and that's usually screening for certain infections. So you have to get an MTV quant, hep B and hep C testing and HIV testing and you have to submit those results to the dialysis center for the patient to be accepted. So it's good to order those labs several days ahead of time because those can take a few days to come back. Next is caregiving needs. How much caregiving does your patient need? How much supervision does your patient need? It's really good to anticipate this because you need to figure out whether or not it's safe for your patient to go home. If your patient lives alone and they're pretty deconditioned and debilitated after being in the hospital, then it's not safe for them to go back to that same home situation. You need to make sure that there's some sort of caregiving support. Now, an important distinction here, home health is not the same as caregiving. So home health is basically a nurse coming a couple times a week to do vital signs and check on the patient. It's not someone coming to 
stay with them for hours on end and take care of them like a caregiver would. A caregiver is not covered by insurance, so if your patient wants to go home, they don't have anyone to supervise them and they can't get around on their own, they can't take care of themselves, they're gonna have to hire a caregiver and that is out of pocket. And if that's not an option, then oftentimes the patient might end up needing to go to a rehab facility before they can transition back home. So this is another area where the physical or occupational therapist can help. If you can't really determine on the spot how much caregiving your patient might need, they can often comment on that. They can comment on how much supervision your patient needs to do things like activities of daily living or even transferring from one place to another. So next is language barriers and low health literacy. So it's really, really important to consider whether or not there are barriers to a patient understanding what's going on with their own health and understanding what needs to be done after their discharge. So it's important to pick up on whether or not the patient is good at speaking English and if they're not, always, always, always use a phone interpreter when you're doing your patient education or if a patient clearly has low health literacy, then you might spend extra time on that patient education and using that teach back method to make sure that the patient understands what's going on as much as possible. Family members and other loved ones can be really helpful in these situations. So one common situation I've had is if I have a patient who doesn't speak English well, but maybe their adult child or a friend or spouse does speak English really well, then it's really nice to have that person around for conversations with the patient's permission, of course. But it's important to have them around for conversations, even if you are using a phone interpreter, because a phone interpreter often isn't perfect and it's good to, to have more than one person besides the patient understand what's going on so that if there's any misunderstanding or if the patient has any questions after discharge, at least one other person was present for the conversation. So the next thing is removal of any tubes, drains, or lines. So this is really, really key because if you put something in the patient and you don't want them to go home on it, you have to remember to remove it before they leave. So a common one that can be forgotten is a Foley catheter. So patients will have a Foley catheter placed maybe in the ER or something on admission and then it's not good, but sometimes people forget that it's there and then they try to discharge a patient and you're like, wait, there's a, there's a Foley. So you have to do a voiding trial before the patient leaves and that again delays discharge. So as much as possible, keep track of all your tubes, lines, and drains in your progress notes every day and remove things as soon as they are not necessary anymore. So next thing is transportation home. It's pretty self-explanatory, but don't just assume that a patient has a ride home in place. Always remind them because a patient might have to depend on a family member or something to pick them up. Or if they don't have anyone to pick them up, they might need help getting an Uber or a bus pass to get home. Where I work, the social worker can help with this. So it's important to know who to contact to help the patient out with that. But it's important to arrange this, you know, before the day of discharge or just as soon as possible so that it doesn't delay things. Whew. Okay, so that was a long list, right? But those are all the things that you need to consider when you're discharging a patient. So I know it's a lot and it can be overwhelming. So there are tips and tricks that I have for you to keep track of these things during the hospitalization. So watch part two if you wanna continue learning. As usual, please like and subscribe to support my channel. I really appreciate you guys. And also put in the comments any potential topics that you guys wanna learn about. I definitely take them seriously. In fact, discharge planning was one of the requested topics. So happy to make whatever videos that you guys find most helpful. Bye guys.